Excellencies, distinguished guests, thank you and good morning. It's a great pleasure and honor to be a part of this important event and share in the work and share in the important work of UN Women's He for She initiative. As a journalist who covers inequality in the workforce, it's especially meaningful to be here at a time when we see the rights of women and girls repeatedly challenged and endangered. Though it seems as though we're finally emerging from the worst of the pandemic, its harsh effects on women continue to be felt and frankly, in many cases, ignored. From lost income to disproportionate caregiving responsibilities to greater incidents of domestic violence, the pandemic's impact was and continues to be most felt by women and girls. On top of this, the war in Ukraine and the recent floods in Pakistan have resulted in displacement, destruction of homes, upheaval of livelihoods, and challenges to the security of millions of people, the burdens of which will again be disproportionately felt by women. Today, we're going to hear from an assembly of global leaders who've committed themselves to taking action for gender equality and improving the lives of women and girls globally. From the worlds of politics to business, global development, and social justice, we'll learn firsthand how gender inequality is being addressed from national to community to local levels. These leaders are known as He For She champions and form the new He For She Alliance. Each has made an ambitious yet tangible commitment to accelerate progress towards gender equality. There is still much to be done, but their actions are deeply welcomed as examples of leadership that can drive change forward. Some are joining us for the first time today and some are renewing their commitments. We'll hear what lessons and insights we can take from them and apply to our own future efforts. And we'll examine how and why creating partnerships with powerful and influential men and their organizations creates allies in transforming power and influence to progress the gender quality agenda. Finally, I'd like to take a minute to thank the He For She champions for their contributions, which have made this event possible today. Thank you for your support to UN Women and for your work to advance and, pr and promote its goals. Big thanks also go out to the employees of Spotify who have come together to lead the single largest employee giving program in 2022. It amplified their individual impact and supported their work on empowering women and girls across the world. They show what we can do as individuals when we come together to support gender equality at every level. Distinguished guests, our program today is filled with dynamic conversations on important topics like the compounding effects of the humanitarian crises on gender equality, as well as improving the representation of women in leadership. We have incredible musical performances for you, as well as stories from around the world on how, by building on the hard work and success of the women's movement, he for she has inspired millions of men and boys to advocate for gender equality. So without further ado, to open us up, it is my honor to introduce and invite to the stage Ms. Seema Bahus, the Executive Director of UN Women. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here supporting the He for She. Prime Minister Kishida of Japan, Your Excellencies, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. UN Women recently launched SDG Gender Snapshot, and it tells us that it may take close to 300 years to achieve full gender equality and the realization of women's rights. I don't think anyone of us who are here today would like to wait another 300 years. So we must continue to prod on. Global challenges, including the COVID-19 pandemic and its aftermath, 
violent conflicts, the climate emergency, and the backlash against women's rights are further intensifying pressures on our progress towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. These challenges require a whole-of-society effort. They require women to lead and men as allies. They require a shift in a fundamental power imbalance between women and men. A more equal society is a more prosperous and a peaceful one, and that we know for sure. This summit offers an opportunity to recommit to concerted action on the obstacles that stubbornly block women's and girls' realization of their full legal, economic, and political equality. It is the moment to mobilize men's agency and responsibilities in the achievement of gender equality. This is one of the crucial strengths of the He for She movement, to recognize the allyship of men in support of women's empowerment. When men and boys recognize and acknowledge their privileges as males, it is a step towards acknowledging that women and girls face discrimination throughout their life cycle. Your Excellencies, I have three asks of men and boys around the world. One, recognize the universality of what causes gender inequality. The pursuit of gender equality differs from one country to another, but the root causes of discrimination and inequality are the same across every society. Unfair gender roles, normalized violence, and the undermining of women and girls. In every country, changing this is the work we must do together. Two, challenge negative masculinities. This includes the pressure to display macho behaviors. We often see negative masculinity in the form of the violence that showed up, shows up in the streets, at home, at work, in schools, and in public spaces, as well as online. We need role models that demonstrate positive masculinities that showcase inclusive leadership and responsibilities. Three, take responsibility for sharing your platform. I ask you to be proactive in sharing the spaces that patriarchy has granted you so as to elevate and accelerate girls' and women's participation and leadership. I also ask of you to lead by example to engage more men and boys, to be innovative in how you challenge the gender imbalance in your daily lives. Achieving full gender equality requires a profound shift in individual attitudes and behaviors, and it must include social progress for all groups in society. We must leave no one behind in our work. If we are able to do this, Together, we will have more peaceful, just, and sustainable societies. Together, as allies, we can make this a reality across every aspect of our daily lives. Let us act together now. I thank you. Thank you, Executive Director, for providing us with that passionate call to action. It is a privilege to introduce our next speaker, His Excellency Mr. Fumio Kishida, the Prime Minister of Japan. It is a particularly special occasion as Prime Minister Kishida joined He for She as a champion just this year, and we're honored and delighted to have the Prime Minister as part of the Alliance. But before he speaks, please let us take a moment of silence and reflection of our former He for She champion and Prime Minister Kishida's recent predecessor, Mr. Shinzo Abe.
Thank you all. And now, please welcome the Prime Minister of Japan. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am Kishida Fumio, Prime Minister of Japan. え、本会合の主催者である、え、バフース、UN運営事務局長、え、ご列席のチャンピオンの皆様方、え、そしてえ、P4C支持者の方々とえ、この場に集うことができますこと、え、大変嬉しく思っています。え、そして、第2期チャンピオンとして就任することを光栄に思っています。It is my great pleasure to be here today with all of you. Dr. Bahus, Executive Director of UN Women, the host of today's summit, all champions in attendance, and he for she supporters. I am also honored to be appointed as the second he for she champion from Japan, following the path already traced by the late former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, the first champion from our country. え、日本のジェンダー平等の実現に向けたコミットメントは不変です。え、本日は新しいチャンピオンとしてそのための具体的な取り組みについて Japan's commitment to achieving gender equality will not change. Today, I would like to introduce to you some concrete initiatives I have been spearheading as a new champion. まず、未来を開く新しい資本主義です。え、これは成長と分配を両輪にしたイニシアティブであり、その中核は女性の経済的自立であります。え、これは男女の賃金格差など我が国の女性が直面している構造的なま問題への対応、そしてすべての女性が自ら選んだ道を歩んでいくための重要な鍵です。First, I would like to touch upon my vision of a new form of capitalism with a view to reviving the Japanese economy and opening up our future. This is an approach we have introduced under my initiative that is based on growth and distribution with women's economic independence at its, as its core. And we believe this approach is key to addressing the structural problems that women are facing in Japan, such as the wage gap between men and women, and enabling all women to choose their own paths in life. え、また日本は官民挙げてえ、ジェンダー平等と女性のエンパワーメントに向けた取り組みを強化しており、え、本日、井出小場久幸リクルートホールディングスCEOとCEOが私とともにチャンピオンに就任したことはその勝者です。Furthermore, Japan has been strengthening its efforts toward realizing gender equality and promoting women's empowerment, both in the public and private sectors. Today's appointment of Mr. Idekoba Hisayuki, CEO of Recruit Holdings, as a champion together with myself is proof of such efforts.全社会的な意識改革が必要です。男女全ての人が生きやすい社会を作るべく、日本はHE4Cの理念にのっとり、これまで様々な途上国支援を行ってきました。今後もUNWomenとの連携を一層強化し、誰一人取り残さない社会を
and will contribute to creating a society in which no one is left behind. ウクライナをはじめ世界各地で女性や女児たちが紛争下の性的暴力という重大な人権侵害に直面しています。日本政府は紛争関連の性的暴力生存者のためのグローバル基金への貢献を続けており、今回、さらに200万ユーロの追加拠出を実施いたしました。傷ついた女性や女児たちが尊厳を取り戻し、また自分らしく生きていくためのサポートを日本は継続していきます。Women and girls are facing a grave human rights violation of sexual violence in conflict. The government of Japan has been contributing to the Global Fund for Survivors of Conflict Related Sexual Violence, to which we have recently contributed an additional 2 million euros. Japan will continue to support traumatized women and girls with a view to helping them regain their dignity. And be able to live their lives on their own terms again. こうした私の目標にさらなる推進力を得るため、本年12月3日、国際女性会議 WOW を東京で開催いたします。本日もここに同席している森雅子総理補佐官が中心になって準備を進めています。今年のテーマは WOW、えー、WOW for Maintaining gender into a new form of capitalism. This is the way the people of the world are in the world. The people of the world are in the world. The people of the world are in the world. The people of the world are in the world. The people of the world are in the world. In order to accelerate efforts to achieve these initiatives, on December 3rd of this year, We will host the World Assembly for Women, which is WOW for short, in Tokyo. My special advisor on women's empowerment, Ms. Mori Masako, who is also with us here today, is leading the preparatory work for this. The theme of WOW 2022 is WOW for mainstreaming gender into a new form of capitalism. We look forward to, a, to lively discussions with people worldwide toward creating a new society and economy that respects diversity and women. I look forward to your, your participation in this year as well. 来年、日本は G7 の議長国を務めます。また、国連安全保障理事会では、非常任理事国に就任します。引き続き、国際社会の責任ある一員として、さまざまな声に耳を傾けながら、ジェンダー平等に向け、力強く貢献していきたいと考えています。In 2023, Japan will assume the G7 presidency. We will also become a non permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. As a responsible member of the international community, we will continue to listen to various voices of the international community and will make strong contributions. Thank you, Prime Minister, for your commitment and all you are undertaking as a champion and for the example you set for other world leaders. Because of his prior engagements, he needs to, needs to go ahead and leave now, but we want to thank him for taking the time to be here today during the busy General Assembly week. And now let's take a moment and revisit what brings us together today.
we want to end gender inequality. And to do this, we need everyone involved. We men must play an active role in ensuring a more just world. It's about engaging governments, businesses, and universities, and having them make concrete commitments to gender equality. Why is it always women who have to break through the glass ceiling? Where are the men willing to throw boulders down through it? And so you do need men to partner in terms of undoing those injustices uh, when you look at things like pay equality. Gender equality and gender equity make 100% business sense. We shall commit ourselves to ensuring that there's no gender-based violence, no child abuse, no forced early child marriages. Men must also take a stand. Воспитывайте своих детей, объясняйте, что насилие это неправильно, его не должно быть ни в каком виде. We have the opportunity to change something now. That's what he for she is about. Gender equality is good for everyone. Are you with us? As we can see, gaps in gender equality persist and they're reinforced Thank you. And they're reinforced by long-standing obstacles. Given these conditions, the work of organizations and initiatives like He for She, with its partners and champions, is necessary and vital to increasing gender equality. It's a great joy to have leaders representing countries and continents here with us today. Ernest Hemingway said that courage is grace under pressure. Our next speaker not only exhibits grace, but fortitude and relentlessness in the pursuit of freedom, the protection of a nation's people, especially women. She embodies heroic leadership of women under the most difficult of circumstances and inspires not only the citizens of her own country, but millions of people around the globe. It is a great honor to introduce and welcome to the stage the First Lady of Ukraine, Ms. Olena Zelenska. Thank you. Ваші високоповажності, пані та панове, дорогі друзі, для мене велика честь бути сьогодні тут і мати змогу поділитися своїми думками з приводу рівності чоловіків та жінок. And have this opportunity to share with you my thoughts about the equality between men and women. На жаль, в 21-му столітті ми все ще маємо говорити про рівні права для жінки і чоловіка. Unfortunately, still in the 21st century, we have to talk about the equal rights for men and women. 
Ми все ще маємо боротися за рівні можливості для людей незалежно від раси, політичних, релігійних та інших переконань, етнічного та соціального походження, майнового стану, місця проживання, національності. Ми ще маємо боротися за рівні можливості для людей, незалежно від раси, політичних, релігійних та інших переконань, місця проживання, their property status, their place of residence and nationality. Ми в Україні, як ніхто, знаємо ще одну річ. У часи потрясінь нерівність відчувається набагато гостріше, вона оголює нерви. In Ukraine, we, as no one else in the world, know another thing. During the disturbances, the equality feels much stronger, much more than usual. The war exposes the nerves, exposes the truth. Чи запитали ви себе, як це бути жінкою під час війни? Did you ask yourself the question, how was it to be a woman during the war? До яких викликів слід бути готовою? To what kind of challenges you have to be prepared for? Я можу розказати про це від імені моїх співвітчизнів, українок. I can tell you about it on behalf of my country women, Ukrainian women. З початку повномасштабної агресії РФ проти України мою країну залишили мільйони людей, і це переважно жінки та діти. Since start of the full-fledged aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine, millions of people left my country, and mostly these are women and children. Це люди, які раптово втратили все. Все, що мали і чим жили. These are the people that suddenly lost everything, everything what they had, everything what they lived for. Дім, роботу, бізнес, перспективи. І водночас вони самостійно несуть відповідальність за себе, своїх дітей, літніх родичів. Their houses, work, business, perspectives for life. And at the same time, they independently are responsible for themselves for their children and for their elderly relatives. Фактично кожна з моїх співвітчизниць зараз виконує індивідуальну рятувальну місію. Practically each of my country women right now is a saver, has as her own individual saving mission. Їжа і дах над головою, доступ до засобів гігієни, медикаменти. Робота і освіта для дітей, здоров'я, фізична безпека – це щоденні переживання кожної жінки, яку війна змусила покинути дім. That was forced due to the war leave the country. Яка ще вчора мала стабільне життя, як ті, хто присутні в цій залі. A woman that still yesterday had a stable life, that those who are here present in this room today. Усе те, що у мирний час є звичним і доступним, у час війни є благом, за яке потрібно боротися, яке потрібно виборювати. All these things that during the peaceful times is normal and is accessible during the war becomes a blessing that you have to fight for. Вимушена міграція робить людей вразливими. Насильство, торгівля людьми, гвалтування – це ті ризики, які ми вже зараз знаємо і маємо знати і попередити, як захистити українських жінок. Forced migration makes people vulnerable. Violence, trafficking in people, rape, these all are risks that we already know about and we need to prevent them to protect Ukrainian women. У мирний час ми б мали розкіш подискутувати. В умовах війни ми маємо рішуче діяти. Тож я питаю весь світ, кожного. In the peaceful time we would have had time to discuss about it. That would be a luxury now. During the time we have, during the time of war, we have to be resolute. That's why I ask the entire world, each of you. If you are a citizen, 
Які двері ви відкриєте для жінок, що вимушено залишили свої домівки? Чи дасте їм роботу, яка буде гідно оплачуватися та справедливі вихідні? Would you be able to give them a job that would be properly paid for and fair holidays? Якщо ви правоохоронець, як ви будете реагувати на насильство проти жінки воєнної переселенки? If you are the law enforcement agent, how are you going to be reacting to the violence, exploitation uh, regarding women, women that were forcibly displaced? Чи зможете запобігти тому, щоб вони не стали жертвами торгівлі людьми? Чи зможете захистити їх як громадянок своєї країни? Would you be able to protect them to so they are not become a victims of a trafficking in person? Would you be able to protect them as you would do that for the people of your own country? Якщо ви місцевий житель у своїй країні, чи вистачить вам сил чути жінку-біженку чи дитину-біженця? If you are a local resident in your country, would you be strong enough to listen to a woman refugee, to a child refugee? Чи вистачить вашої емпатії і терплячості до того моменту, поки вони зможуть повернутися у мирну Україну? Would you have enough empathy and patience? Till that moment when they will be able to return to peaceful Ukraine. Ваша відповідь, навіть якщо ви її не озвучите, дуже важлива, бо вона саме про рівність тут і зараз. Your answer, even though if you wouldn't voice it now, it's very important because it is about the equality here and now. Про те, як ми слідуємо тим принципам, що самі декларуємо. That's about how we follow the principles that we ourselves declare. Я хотіла б жити в світі, де відмінності між людьми це лише ознака різноманіття. I would like to live in the world where differences between people it's only a sign of diversity. Я хотіла б жити у світі, де ініціатива he for she не потрібна. I would like to live in the world when the initiative he for she is not needed. Саме зараз люди в Україні виборюють такий світ. Exactly now the people in Ukraine are fighting for such a world. Дякую вам за підтримку і давайте далі боротися пліч-о-пліч до перемоги. Дякую. And let's together fight shoulder to fold a shoulder until we win. Thank you. Thank you, First Lady, for your presence here today and for your inspiring words and your example. Your courage and tireless works on behalf of the Ukrainian people, especially the women and children, have inspired millions of us around the world. Thank you, and we appreciate you taking this moment to be here with us today during this very busy week. And now we will build on First Lady Zelenska's message by hearing from our first panel, on the compounding effects of crisis on gender. Please welcome them to the stage. Please. Bob, Ralph, 
Wang Shi, please. Please, Ralph, Bob. This way will be gender balance with two women and two men. <laughs> please have a seat. So nice to see you. How are you? Yeah, much appreciated. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anita Bhatia, and I'm one of UN Women's two deputy executive directors. My colleague, Osa Regner, is here with me as well. And on behalf of UN Women, can I just say that we are so delighted to be able to have this event today and this really important conversation. So you know that we're here to talk about he for she, for men who are champions for gender equality, but also to be informed in this dialogue by the zeitgeist and what is happening around us. And what is happening around us, we just heard so eloquently from the First Lady of Ukraine about the condition of women who are being forced to live lives that they never thought that they would have to live. So as we think about Ukraine and the women in Ukraine, let us also think about women who are suffering in Syria, in Ethiopia, in Haiti, in Myanmar. There are humanitarian crises all over the world today, and that should inform our discussion because all of us in this room are actually incredibly privileged to even be sitting here to have this conversation. So I want to speak to our distinguished panelists today to say why, to talk to us about how do they see the world, how do they see their role as champions, and what responsibility do they think they have as leaders to try to bring about real change in the lives of women and girls. So I'm going to start with you, Ralph, and not just because you're immediately on my left, <laughs> uh, but uh, Ralph is the CEO of the MTN Group, and I want to start by asking you a question, Ralph, about the fact that CEOs today don't worry just about profits. And you don't worry just about your shareholders, you worry about your stakeholders. And as you worry about your stakeholders and as you look at the world in crisis, tell us how you, as CEO of MTN Group, are thinking about the role of technology in responding to the needs of women and girls today. Well, thanks very much. And um, is my mic on? Yeah. Um, thanks very much uh, for having us uh, as the MTN Group. Uh, we serve about 280 million uh, Africans and people in the Middle East uh, with uh, telecommunication services. We have 17,000 people across uh, our company, uh, across 19 markets. And um, you know, just shy of 40% of those staff members are women. Um, and we feel that we have a very important role in society to provide digital and financial inclusion to everybody. Nobody must be uh, left behind. And to your point, as a company, we've moved far away from the idea of shareholder capitalism. We're all about stakeholder capitalism, if you want to use that as a phrase. Mm -hmm. So we look more broadly about our contribution to society. And as we think about what society really needs and what creates advantage for us as the MTN group, we see diversity and inclusion as a critical part of who we are and who we want to see outside of our own organization. And therein lies what becomes very natural for us to be supporting the He for She Alliance as uh, the MTN group. So we've made commitments specifically around um, you know, gender equality, well within this decade, and that goes to all echelons of the company, uh, at the leadership and the board level. Uh, we're a technology company, so we want to see more women in um, technology roles. Um, and we're dealing with the issues, the real issues about uh, pay. Uh, there has been in the past, you know, to deal with the issues that have been well uh, uh, raised around, uh, you know, women not being seen as equal. The pay issue is another very big issue that we are we're dealing with. Coming to your point really around what technology can do, and as you raise, there are several crises that we're facing, and the other crisis like in a country like Nigeria, where there's been kidnapping, there's a story that many of you remember, 
Uh, you know, over 200 girls were abducted. Um, and uh, there's also the issues of famine uh, that we're dealing with across the continent of Africa. Technology can be a real powerful uh, tool for democracy and transparency and the ability to communicate information without restriction. And uh, we, in our approach of delivering digital services, are very focused on ensuring that we are focused and uh, dealing with those issues, um, mindful of the fact that we operate within a regulatory framework. I mean, I guess the other big issue that we are pushing and wanting to be um, an agent for change is really around gender-based violence. Um, it is a topic that in, in our continent, our major continent, Africa, is relatively taboo. Uh, you know, women feel afraid to speak up, and we need to create and become the catalyst for them to say, listen, we need to find me means and ways to be able to speak up. So that's some of the things that we, as a technology-based company, can deliver to support uh, you know, the, the just cause for diversity and inclusion. Thank you very much, Ralph. Uh, really interesting to hear you say that as a private company, you are taking on this issue of gender-based violence as well, because it's not something that companies usually like to discuss, acknowledge. Many people think of this as a private matter that has to be dealt with at the household level. So it's really great that you are willing to face not just issues that are within the company in which you can control, like pay gaps and recruitment processes and promotion processes, but also issues that are fundamental to the safety and security of women everywhere, which are issues like violence against women. With that, I'm going to come to you, Bob. Bob is the global uh, chairman of PwC and has a long-standing he for she champion. Great to have you with us again, Bob. And um, I want to ask you, I think you saw in PwC, as did many other CEOs, that the pandemic really changed women's view of work, and it really changed the amount of work women had to do, because suddenly the issue of unpaid care, which, by the way, all women know about because we live it, suddenly shot into the limelight as an issue of public policy because so many women were forced to leave the labor force because they can't manage both work and home. How at PwC have you been think, have, how have you been impacted by this? How are you thinking about it and what are you going to do to help solve it? Yeah, thanks Anita and good morning everybody and it's a pleasure to be here again as a long-standing founding member of He for She. It's an important cause and we m remain committed to that. As we step back and think about the environment, I'll first start with any crisis. It could be in the Ukraine, it could be COVID. Our philosophy from a framework perspective is first the safety of our people, mm -hmm. then the economic certainty that they need in terms of job security, job opportunity, pay, and the like, and within that, the benefits that are needed to actually deal with the crisis at hand. So there was a tremendous shift probably in the first six months or so that went to two major themes. One was the amount of coaching, care, and additional support mm -hmm. to deal with family care more mm -hmm. broadly. Mm -hmm. That could be children, that could be home life, that could be parents, grandparents, whatever definition of family care yeah. was extremely important. So additional benefits were brought in in that regard. The second thing was, and I want to go where Ralph went, in the COVID world, more people at home, more stress, the issue of abuse, any type of abuse, became more prevailing and possible. And as a result, we also had to have interventions on a worldwide basis to bring that awareness to the table and make sure that our people in PwC had the opportunity to manage that issue and get the help that they needed whenever it was, however it was. And so do you that actually in, talked about we violence talked to, uh, at similar PwC? To Ralph, you had to do it within PwC and for the communities in which we're involved in. So it wasn't just a community issue, it was a PwC issue. And I'm gonna argue, we're 335,000 people around the world. We're a symptom of society. We're a symbol of society. We have all the issues that society has. Mm -hmm. And we had to acknowledge that from, a, from a, a primary ownership perspective to think about sort of our people. The other thing that we did focus on is to make sure that women were not disadvantaged during this time in terms of recruitment, promotion, pay, and the like. And this is where data is so important. At PwC, we actually don't have an issue recruiting women. 
we, we actually recruit 50-ish percent women into the organization. It's actually the promotions and the senior promotions that's the challenge. So our actions can't be broad brushed. They have to be very specific to the challenge you're trying to take on. And that's a really important factor. And the last thing I'll say, Anita, when you think about the ESG agenda, the stakeholder capital agenda, mm -hmm. you can't just sit there and worry about your own company. You have to think about what can my company do for society at large. Mm -hmm. And in this regard, four or five years ago, we joined an organization called Generation Unlimited. It was focused on, it's an offset of uh, UNICEF, its focus was on connecting youth, giving them higher education and better skills, entrepreneurship, so there's actually opportunities for them when they have those skills, mm -hmm. and empowering the youth. And we've been involved in this now earnestly for the last couple of years. During the pandemic, I, I actually lead the, uh, the uh, Global Leadership Council. Alan Jope, the CEO of Unilever, leads the board. We made a decision to pivot our efforts towards girls because that's where the education aspect was truly needed. And to get to where the country's most negatively impacted by COVID, by climate distress, and other aspects were important. So again, I think the responsibility of leadership is not only to take care of your own people, but also think bigger than that in terms of the obligation that our organization has to society at large. No, thank you very much, Bob. And thank you so much for mentioning this issue of education because one of the big issues the world is facing today is the issue of learning poverty for girls. And it is really remarkable that in some countries, Peru and the Philippines, girls have not been in school. These are just two instances, there are more. Girls have not been in school for two years. And now you, you cannot have a girl who was in grade four go back to school in grade seven and just be told, hey, just figure it out. So we are facing a very major challenge in how we are going to get girls back into the school system. So that's just one of the key issues on gender equality that we're facing today. But thank you for mentioning that. I want to come to you now, Wangeshi. You are the CEO of the Center for Rights Awareness in Nairobi, based in Nairobi, Kenya. You've heard from two male allies. You've been working for a long time to actualize the rights of women and girls. From your perspective and based on your work, how do you see the role of men as allies and what do you think they can do more of to be even more powerful allies? Thank you and good morning everyone. I'm very, very delighted to be here. Um, I work for a women's rights organization that is based in Nairobi, and we focus on women who are survivors of violence, meaning that we have a toll free line that women can be able to call and be able to get psychosocial support, get legal support, be able to get referrals to the services that are very, very critical. And I must say that this work, when we look at the resources that is allocated, is really minimal. Mm. Our work also focuses on increasing women in leadership, uh, working on issues of uh, sexual and reproductive health rights, but most important, economic empowerment of women, because without financial independence, it's very, very difficult for women to negotiate, for women to live an um, abusive environment. So when I look at what is happening, I think we all understand that we have more men dominating leadership position, whether it's in the private sector, whether it is the public sector, a lot of domination is men. And therefore, as women, we must be able to engage with men. When we look at today, we're in New York and the 77 General Assembly is happening. We have about 193 members. Out of that, I think you mentioned we only have 28 women. So if in, at a global level we are at 193 and only 28 women, that is not even half, uh, 50%. We have a long way to go, meaning then we must be able to engage men. And then when you look at the recent World uh, Economic uh, Report, it will take 132 years for us to get to where we call gender parity. Can the women and the girls in the world do they have 132 years? Do we in this room have 132 years? I doubt we have that kind of timeline. So time is up. 
And as an organization that has been on the forefront working with men, we have been able to work with them in terms of legislation. And some of the legislation that working with men as alliance, at our National Assembly, women make only 21%, meaning issues that are seen to be sensitive because they are women issues, because it's around domestic violence, they're not going to be supported when it is brought to the assembly mm. by women. So yeah. what, as a strategy, what we have done is really be able to work with men who are members of parliament to see how can they be able to bring this to parliament. And once they are the face of this legislation, they are able to confront any backlash, they are able to confront any um, limitations that are going to be put out there, and they are able to support. And I have good examples. The prevention on domestic violence was brought into parliament in 19, 1964, just after independence. And because our parliament for a long time was dominated by men, in 2022, we engage, in 2012, we engaged men to be the carriers of the bill. And within less than six months, the bill had passed. Never mind the amount of time it took. The female genital mutilation legislation, again, it took the face of a man to be able to carry to parliament and to be able to go with it so that then it can be, uh, to be passed. At the community level where we work, we work very closely with, with men. And for us, it's very, very critical. Yeah. Because if there is a survivor who we need help, then there is a champion who can be able to refer them to any of the services. It's about engaging men and boys. Engaging fathers so that he can be able to make a decision that my daughter is going to go to school and I'm not going to receive two she two goats in exchange of my daughter getting married. You know, making such decisions so that this girl can be able to go back to school. If she's pregnant and comes back home, that the father can be able to make a decision and say, this young girl, well, she is pregnant. She will deliver the child, but she has an opportunity to go back to school. That is the kind of engagement that we're doing with the boys. That is the engagement we're doing with the men. That is the engagement we're doing with the fathers. We're engaging the religious institution. Again, another critical institution because it's dominated by men. So working with them to ensure that if a survivor comes in, if a woman who is going through violence, then can be able to be supported. I and love these the practical examples. Example. I love these practical examples of how men can really be allies, whether it's legislation, changing attitudes, making sure daughters are going back to school. That's exactly what we need. I want to close us out, but I want, before we do that, I want to come to you, each of you, and I'm going to ask you, if there's one action that you had to say that all these potential he for she champions in the audience could do, what would that be, Bob? Very quickly, it's respectful, intrusive activism to make the change that you just described and use the data as the basis for the decisions you made. There's plenty of data, there's plenty of analysis, the facts make this clear. We were at dinner last night, 193 countries in the world, only 12, right? 12. 28. To, no, 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 12 oh. have the rights where women yes. have equal right. rights to men yes. Yes. by law. Yes. That's a fact. Yes. That's embarrassing. Yes. and stupidity at its best. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. Well said. <laughs> Ralph, one action from you. To me, it's about men creating the sense of belonging in their spaces, in yeah. society and institutions. Yes. Because when women feel that they don't have to be anything other than themselves, they will flourish. And this whole sense of belonging to me uh, you know, creates the culture where um, we will see women thrive through organizations, through society. So create the sense of belonging. Create the sense of belonging. <laughs> Give it up for that. Wang Yishi. I think my, last, uh, my comment is that we must double our efforts. <laughs> we must double our efforts. The campaign is here. It must be able to get to the villages in every part of the world. Yes. That's a challenge we have from Double the efforts and localize it. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the close of our panel, but before I, we all walk off the stage, I'm going to ask each of you to leave the audience with one word that to you encapsulates what he for she means to you. One word. Bob. 
Promise. 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 Ralph. Legacy. Legacy. Courage. Courage. I love it. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Please applause. Ralph Mopita, CEO of MTN. Wangishi Wachiri, head of the Center for Rights Awareness. Bob Moritz, Global Chairman, PwC. Thank you so much, everyone. Hello, I'm Nick Reed, CEO of Vodafone Group. Vodafone has been part of the He For She Alliance since it was founded over six years ago, and we're honored to be part of this movement. At Vodafone, we recognize that tackling domestic abuse is fundamental to women's rights. We do this through our technology, raising awareness about domestic abuse, and supporting our employees through our dedicated policy. For over a decade, Vodafone Foundation has used technology to connect over 1.5 million people affected by domestic abuse to information, advice and support. Our Bright Sky app is available in 11 countries and is preparing to launch in three more over the next 12 months. It provides practical support on spotting the signs of abuse and how to respond. It uses location data to help users find their nearest support services. Bright Sky is for survivors and anyone concerned about their family, friends or colleagues. We also continuously shine a light on domestic abuse through our research and awareness campaigns. This summer, Vodafone Foundation reached over 10 million women through our It's Not Nothing global social media campaign to raise awareness of coercive control. This campaign guided the audience to Bright Sky. In addition to our technology and awareness campaigns, we support our employees through our dedicated policy. It recognizes that abuse in all its forms is a work issue. Our policy supports survivors at work through specialist support, safety and security measures, paid safe leave and employee training. Clearly, no company can tackle this critical societal issue on its own. Our research shows that 16% of employees said their employers have policies supporting survivors at work. This figure has not changed since 2019. Our toolkit and research are publicly available to support all employers to adapt similar policies. Our partnership with He For She is also a catalyst to share our work and develop further initiatives. Let me close with a very clear call to action that only by working together can we send a clear message. We must all take action within our organizations and in society as a whole to end the cycle of domestic abuse. Thank you to each of our panelists for leading such a critical discussion, and thank you to Vodafone for leading the world and setting an example for others to follow in supporting victims of domestic violence. From the experiences and insights we've just heard, it's apparent that viewing crises like war, famine, and climate change through a monolithic lens ignores how these events affect women in different ways and how often the special needs of women and those they care for require a gender focus to ensure that their needs are met. Before introducing our next speakers, I'm delighted to bring to the stage a group of performers who will sing a song especially created and written for UN Women and it's at its launch at 2000, in 2011. Please join me in welcoming the Broadway singers performing One Woman. In Kangali, she 
wakes up, she makes a choice in Hanoi, Nepal, Ramallah, and Tangier. She takes a breath, lifts up her voice in Lahore, La Paz, Kampala, though she's half a world away. Something in me wants to say We are one woman You cry and I hear you We are one woman You hurt and I hurt too We are one woman Your hopes are mine and we shall shine in what as she speaks the truth she reaches out and teaches others how to in jaipur she gives her name she lives without shame in manila salta and poo Though we're different as can be We're connected, she with me We are one woman Your courage keeps me strong. strong We are one woman You sing, I sing alone Thank you again to our singers. What a treat to have a piece of Broadway with us here at today's summit. Now, when it comes to empowering women in the workplace and helping address unequal wages and unequal opportunity, our next speaker is uniquely placed. Hishaiki Didakopa is the CEO of Recruit Holdings Incorporated, whose companies include Indeed and Glassdoor, which are major players in the recruiting and hiring space. Please welcome to, this, to the stage, Mr. Itacopa.
Good morning. I'm really, uh, thank you, honored to be here today to join the T4C community as a corporate champion and to offer recruit groups support for this groundbreaking global initiatives. To come together to make progress towards supporting women offers a bright light amid the sea of social, political, and economic issues, as well as natural disasters. We must demonstrate relentless compassion and support for all human beings and for our environment. Here in this moment, we have the opportunity to champion women. Women make, women make up about half of the world's population, yet when it comes to the world of work, only 31% of women make up management roles. In some countries, it is as little as 15%. It's actually my home country, Japan. But don't worry, that's why we had Mr. Kishida. <laughs> we will fix it. And experts, we all know that experts estimate it will take over 100 years for women to gain full parity in corporate leadership roles. But as the global leader in HL matching technology, we at Recruit Group refuse to wait that long. As a parent company of Indeed, which is the number one job site in the world, and Glassdoor, a leader in workplace transparency and company insights, we are focused on matching people to opportunities and breaking down existing barriers and biases. We are proud to be the first East Asia-based corporate champion to join this movement. Respecting individual differences is deeply embedded in the culture of our company. We must celebrate individual curiosity and invest in ideas and passions that brings out the best in people. We must innovate and evolve. Only then may we prosper together. This is why, as an employer, we are committed to achieving gender parity at all levels of our company. As a market leader, we are investing in technology that opens up opportunity and employers empower all who want to work. We have an obligation to be catalysts of change and create a more inclusive, equitable world. As a father of two girls, I want nothing more than a future where equal opportunity exists for all. The, there should be no limits on what human beings can achieve. I proudly stand alongside the he for c community and pledge to work together to create a brighter and more equitable future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dakota, for your remarks and for your commitment to gender equality. You and your company have great strategic proximity to labor and hiring markets, and your leadership position and role as a champion offers great potential for driving economic equality, opportunity, and fair treatment in the workplace for women. We look forward to seeing you all. We, will, we look forward to seeing all you accomplish. In a few moments, we'll feature our second panel on the discussion, our second panel discussion on the representation of women in leadership. But first, we have a special video. Please take a look.
Bruce Clever, CEO of the TBS Group. program is part of our global partnership to work together to design a program that's focused on female micro entrepreneurs who largely operate in the informal sector. So here is a big opportunity for us to bring women who are otherwise relegated to survival enterprises. So this partnership enables us to really assist women to move to the next level in terms of their empowerment and then to grow in their businesses. A women project, I learn a lot of things. I develop key skills on management, do competition with your competitors, how you keep your book, how you market your business. There's a lot of things which I'm doing. I know a woman polish me in a different shape and then they make my business shining. The reason we do this is of course clear. We know from the research that women entrepreneurs are more likely than male entrepreneurs to reinvest the proceeds of their businesses, not only in their businesses, but also in their communities. Our vision at De Beers is to accelerate economic inclusion and support diverse voices. So working with UN Women has been a perfect platform to allow us to do both. It's been a great opportunity to learn from UN Women, but also learn from all the other participants in the network. Thank you, and um, we'll continue with the panel discussion. My name is Sando Giambo, and I'm the Executive Director of the UN Global Compact. Really great to have you all here. I have an exciting panel, and I'm just going to challenge them to really see how we can infuse a sense of urgency into everything that we do. None of us is going to be here in 100 years plus, no matter how many vitamins and supplements and how long we're running every day. So let's see if in 20 minutes we can bring some sense of urgency to solving some of these big challenges. I'd love to welcome up my panel, and I'll start with, um, I'll start with a dear colleague, uh, Ursa Regner. She's the Deputy Executive Director of Policy, Programs, Civil Society, and intergovernmental support at UN Women. Ursa also happened to be a former minister of gender, children, and elderly in Sweden. Uh, my second panelist, another dear friend, Ilian Mehov, he's the dean of INSEAD, renowned uh, business school. He's been recognized as a leader in all the work he does in business management and also got a He for She Leader Award from Singapore. And my third panelist is C. Vijaya Kumar, the CEO and Managing Director of HCL Technologies, a leading global firm. And I have been asked to call him CVK after this, so I hope you're comfortable with that. Great. So, dear panelists, we have just about 20 minutes, but a great discussion to have. And I'd like to just kick off and, and sort of re-emphasize a tone and, and, and set, set a context. We've heard from the champions before about the fantastic work that they're doing in different parts of the world to advance um, women's leadership and women's equality. But again, let's paint the picture. Uh, we've also heard that about women hold 8% of leadership positions in Fortune 500 companies. It's a well-known statistic also that it's going to take 151 years to close this gender economic gap. According to WEF, the share of women in leadership roles has seen a steady increase from 33% in 2016 to 37% in 2022, but we know that's not enough. 
um, women are also not hired in equal rates across industries. I think we just heard Ralph of MTN speak about the telecommunications industry. I also happened to be in, in telco before and really saw that it took a lot of effort to get women engineers out there and, and, and really get into the workplace. So I really want to talk about what we're doing as business leaders and academic leaders to drive this forward. So I'd like to start with you, CVK, first. And as a representative of the business community, heading and leading a, a, a successful company, I know you've been highlighted as a you know, top CEO, a disruptive CEO as well. Um, keen to know why it's important for you to take urgent action on gender equality, and, and what do you see you can disrupt since you have been named as a disruptive leader as well? Over to you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to join all of you today and share some insights. Uh, based on my own experience, both personal and professional experience, I think gender equality is a game changer. It's an absolute game changer, and every one of you have to truly experience it in your own lives, in your own organizations. Uh, I want to just share some data, which, which I found was very, very compelling in the call for action to get the urgency around this topic, a few data points just to kind of help set this uh, whole message in a much more compelling way. Uh, Harvard Business Review study revealed that women score higher than men in 17 of the 19 traits considered desirable as a leader. Right. So that's a, that's a amazing, amazing statistics. Uh, research has also shown that firms with more women in senior positions are more profitable. Who doesn't want to be profitable, right? Uh, more socially responsible, which is really the, the most important thing that we're all talking about. Provide safer and high quality customer experience. I think this is something women excel in, and there is enough research which shows uh, this data points. And here is the real game changer. Study after study has shown women are more resilient than men. Today, when crisis has become the new constant, women are far better equipped than men to dig into the reserves of strength, overcome the odds, inspire people, and build back better. These are very, very compelling statistics. And uh, I think each one of you and each, all of us in the corporate world should be inspired by this kind of metrics and showcase of great leadership talent by women. Right? Now, as organizations, uh, when you're looking at various things, uh, we tend to get very qu quantitative in how we approach this. I think it's very important. Uh, people track number of women leaders, number of women in the organization. But I think a more pragmatic approach will be to have uh, quantitative metrics which are multi-dimensional, and also have a number of qualitative metrics uh, in your own organization. Uh, quantitative metrics are not just limited to the percentage of women, uh, the ratio, gender ratio in your organization, but it goes much deeper. You need to look at women and gender ratios in different roles in the company, right? You need, today we have a multi-generational workforce you need to look at gender ratios across different generations. So are these gender ratios that you have in place in your company right now? Yes, of course. We have uh, Gen Z, Gen X, millennials, baby boomers, and even people who, who are uh, older than the baby boomer generation, right? They're all part of our workforce. And today we hire, uh, we have a program, global apprenticeship program, it's called TechBees, where we hire 12th graders and then we train them for one year and really make them very capable uh, technology coders, software coders. Right. So I think one initiative that we've taken is all the entry level hires, we will, we will be more than gender balanced. We'll have more women than men when people enter the workforce. Uh, because in the, in the country, in, in India, a lot of women drop out of uh, work for workforce after four or five years of very, very uh, good careers. Due to, I mean, due to their own preferences, family circumstances, and other pressures. Now, 
we need to induct much more uh, women than men to start with so to kind of build it. And we so do CBK, everything So CBK, I'll stop you at that one because I think you have a great uh, innovative point that I want Ilhan to take on over there because you've talked about bringing 12th graders into the workplace. And I think part of the things that we always talk about is when it really is the right time in an institution to start tackling the issue of gender and gender equality and, and in the workplace as well. So allow me to interrupt you there because I think it's a perfect segue into the question I'm going to ask Ilhan, which we debate for a long time. We, we work together on, on an initiative called Prime, the Principles for Responsible Management Education. And Ilhan, you know, one of the long-standing questions is, when is it the right time in, in management education and in management as a whole and education to really start tackling the issue of gender and equal representation in institutions? I know you've, you've done some incredible things and taken some bold moves in INSEAD, but share with us, you know, why is this important, especially in academia? And right. is it too late at the tertiary level? What, what do we need to do? Uh, to answer this question, yes, it's too late, but before continuing, I want to thank you and women for creating this initiative because I really think that uh, it helps us organize and think what we can do. There are a lot of things that we know work and we can do, but doing it alone or trying to figure out exactly how to do it is very difficult. So thank you very much. It's really a privilege to be here. Also, I want to say that I'm a professor. Uh, I am, um, I'm very passionate about this topic and I'm a man, so I may speak too much, so please stop me. Just <laughs> give me at some point a sign. Uh, so I think that first, it is too late. In fact, I am, um, I'm engaged with a woman who was speaking about seven, eight years ago here in the UN, Leslie Adwin. Uh, Leslie is a very famous filmmaker and she created this, uh, this NGO called Think Equal. And her main argument is, well, she, she looked at uh, sexual violence against women and uh, all kinds of uh, horrible stories. And she realized that actually the men who are doing this are not psychopaths, they're not crazies, they're ones that were taught that this is actually normal, this is okay to do these things. So she created this uh, Think Equal in order to create uh, educational materials for the ages from three to seven, when people can learn how to treat each other with respect. And it's not only about gender, it's about race and everything else. So I think that it is too late, but it doesn't mean that we should not do uh, a lot. And I think that we, we can do a lot of things. The most difficult thing that we know is the biases that all of us have. And they have been building up over ages. And we have them, each one of us have these biases. And sometimes we think, no, no, I, I'm fine, you know, I, I care about these things. But if you want, you'll come to INSEAD, we'll test you. We actually created a case, uh, virtual reality cases, with. I think at the first business school with virtual reality cases, where you're sitting in the boardroom and you're observing the CEO, observing other board members, have, listening to the discussion, obviously, you in, in the movie, and then you have a discussion, you know, what do you think about the CEO? And the class starts discussion, but they didn't know that uh, half of the class was watching the video with a man and the other half with a woman. And the difference in the characteristics that they give to the CEO is mind-boggling. And these are people that I think that are well-educated, they care, they, they worry about these things. So my personal experience, and I know that now you'll give me a sign to stop, but my personal experience is that we actually, um, we all of us sometimes see these biases manifesting themselves when we want to do good, not necessarily when we are, you know, I, I hope that nobody here results to domestic violence and so on. You still want to do good, but you have the bias. So my story is that uh, about five years ago, I was appointing dean of faculty. So the dean of faculty is the most difficult job in a business school or in academic institution because the dean you know, goes to stages, talks about these things, uh, drinks champagne and so on. But the dean of faculty has to go and deal with 160 faculty members who some of them have tenure, can be very aggressive. So I was thinking, I had this uh, very you know, brilliant colleague, uh, a woman, uh, excellent researcher, I, many of you have read her books, uh, um, uh, published tons of papers. She is uh, an excellent teacher, best teacher, what's everything, tick, tick, tick. I was a dean of faculty in 2011-12, and it was just miserable, because people will come and tell to your face, you know, you're an idiot. You know, how can you say these things? How can you do these things? And you cannot do so anything. Ilhan, I am going to cut you short, but I know where the story is going. So, so I'm just going to ask you one simple question. 
This is the challenge that he wants to tell you. He had to appoint one of the first female deans at INSEAD, and it was a challenge. So I want to ask you, what was the, the one emotion? How did you feel as you had to do this, this, this groundbreaking appointment? What so, was going through your mind? So to be honest, my main concern was that all these uh, macho guys will come, will start attacking her, and you know, her sensitivity, she'll start, you know, she'll burn out. And it's not, it was not because I was thinking, will she be capable? I had no doubt that she'll be capable to do with the administrative work. I appointed her and she was by far the best dean of faculty that this school has had in three years that were the most difficult years for a dean of faculty. <laughs> so going back and looking at you know, why was I so uncertain about this and what did I do to help me appoint her? And the answer was that actually I talked to some other people and I was thinking I want to ask her, but you know, what if you know, she goes through all these things and then I will, you know, I'll, I'll feel guilty. So again, I, I was hoping to do good, but at the end of the day, your biases, your biases you know, come it's, uh, So I think that to accelerate where we are, he or she must be much more present in many countries, in many organizations. And we have to talk about these things because that's the only way that 132 years may become hopefully 30 years or maybe less than 30 years. Well, thank you. And I think you've also highlighted the importance of allyship and the, the ability to have people to talk to and, and just let them know that you're facing these challenges at the same time. So I'll, I'll come to you, Ursa, and I think, you know, from your past and current experience, we've talked a lot about policies and you know what policies can do and how they can shape workplaces and, and frameworks and decision making but at the same time more powerful things such as bias and emotion might really stand in the way but my, my question to you is you know what can business leaders do better or different with governments when it comes to policies and advocacy and, and where do you see you know, uh, uh, you know a way in which we can ignite a sense of urgency in this, this uh, interaction between public and private sector. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sandra, for, the, for that question, and thank you for your concrete examples. I think that's what we need, and also that self-reflection that you spoke about. I want to talk about power, because that's what we are actually dealing with here. And we know that uh, women in many, many countries, for example, outperform men academically. And they're doing that on higher and higher levels, even up to PhD right now. But still, men keep their power in the private sector, in politics. And sometimes I'm so impressed by that capacity to actually you know, hold those women back. I travel all over the world. And, <laughs> and, and I see these brilliant, well-organized, thought-through, empathetic, hard-working women with high education or with low education but still, who runs the country, who runs the business? All men. And I want to, I, I think it is important to look at that power and who upholds it and how does that work. And I think that in addition to a lot that we heard today, we really have to deconstruct and see that power. How is it actually, uh, how, how do we uh, uphold it? And most of all, to be honest, the men who benefit from those systems. Um, I do, we see also uh, what happens to women, women who run for parliament in many countries are harassed or they, they experience high levels of, of violence, online violence or in real life, there, there are sexualized threats and, and resistance against them. And I think we have to talk about these things as they are. It is about losing that power. And I do think that there is a lot that men can do. I think they can try the exercise to see that power that they carry with them only you know, for being men and to see the higher value that men have than women. Uh, and I also think when I was a minister for gender equality in my home country, we did a study of women in leadership roles. <laughs> and one thing that came out of it, I'm laughing because one thing that came out of it was that when the researcher asked for what do you think we should do, all the women said, anything but mentorship. Please, no more mentorships. <laughs> Put the That's men in mentorships so that they can see who they are and the power they have. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, actually, 
to all of you for sharing, you know, some of your most deeply personal uh, stories and experiences. So we just have about three minutes left, and I'm going to close by asking each one of you um, a question, which is, you know, in a minute, if you have to impart one action to business leaders who are present here or watching online that you feel they can take away and drive that urgency, what would that one action be um, in a minute? Yeah, maybe I'll take on from the mentorship, right? So I know there is a lot of allergy towards mentorship, but I think what, what we really need to do is sponsorship, right? It's not, it's, there's a lot of difference between sponsorship and mentorship. It's about an ability to find talent and really position them in the right places, give them the right opportunities, talk about the capabilities and the experience that you've had. I think that sponsorship will go a very long way in getting more and more uh, women leaders to take on higher responsibilities. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, Ilhan. Um, I, I mean, I will echo this. I agree with uh, the need to, uh, I mean, what I did, again, I reflect on this, is just do it. I mean, at the end of the day, you just have to go and do it. And I think that, again, I will make a call here let's make he or she more visible because one of the saddest things the, one of the saddest conferences or events that i went to was talk about gender equality uh, at INSEAD. we had this special coach coming from uh, from the netherlands that was in singapore and i looked at the room and there were three men in the room and there were you know 80 women or so so that's why i think that we need to make he or she more visible because that's an accelerator and i completely agree with the sponsorship thank you and over to you sir thank you yeah i think also something that's urgent right now to show that solidarity because i guess the sponsorship is a way of showing solidarity and, and also to discuss that power and how it is upheld uh, I think right now, since we have a lot of visible backlash against women's rights in the world, it would be really powerful and helpful if men with power in di different sectors came together and spoke out spoke out against Roe versus Wade. We know that black women will die to, to, as an, as an uh, effect of this decision. That is a very bad thing. We hear about abuse in Afghanistan. We hear the, the situation in Iran like right now and so on. And if men came together uh, and spoke out against these uh, um, terrible uh, examples of abuse and violence and resistance uh, against women's right to power and to live their own lives. That would be very powerful and it's one step on the way to share that power. Thank you. Great. Thank you so very much. Um, my personal takeaways from this panel, disrupt, get deep into the data, understand what it is. Perhaps we haven't started too early, but it's never too late to start. And we've really got to examine power and where that power lies and what we can do with that power. And hopefully those three things, we can accelerate it a little bit more because 100 plus years, we just don't have the time. Please give a warm hand to our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Assistant Secretary General, and to each of our distinguished panelists. Challenges and obstacles remain substantial for women who are trying to advance in the spheres of education and in the private sector. But the actions we just heard are also encouraging signs that progress, when widely embraced, especially by male allies, can be made if accountability and advocacy for women increase and broaden. Thank you all for your work and for your leadership and for being with us today. We have two special moments now before we close. First, from a few he for she champions who unfortunately could not join us today, but wanted to deliver a special message to you all. Let's watch.
to me means a lot. It means to make sure that I, you know, stick by the standards of being an ally at all possible times. And I set an example. I set an example for the management team. I set an example for those around me. I believe that the first step in becoming a true champion of gender equality is to deeply understand and empathize with the challenges that women face in the workplace. Research indicates really tackling the broken rung steps in advancement, understanding what that broken rung is and focusing on that broken rung, and being humble enough to have feedback mechanisms to understand what is and isn't working and make course correction on a regular basis. We are committed to supporting and advancing gender equality and being the destination where women can grow their career. You can't do anything about what you were born, and you can't do anything about the opportunities and privileges you were given, but what you can do is use that to help people who didn't necessarily get it. Gender equality is a collective obligation. It is not optional. We can make a real difference when we put our combined energy, efforts and commitment and ultimately do the right thing. Thank you to all of our champions for your contributions as valuable members of the He For She Alliance. Your commitments to accountable action and for encouraging other men as allies and advancing the cause of gender equality. I'm now excited to welcome to the stage author and activist, Mr. Frederick Joseph, longtime supporter and ally of He For She and a champion of enabling equality through action. Your Excellencies, Executive Director of UN Women, and distinguished guests. It is my honor to be here with you all today on behalf of He For She, whether that's in person or with us via live feed. I stand before you, each and every one of you, to speak about the human rights of equality and equity that have been denied to so many women for far too long. Women around the world who are no different than my mother, who was told she was too ambitious. No different than my grandmother, who was told she was too intelligent. No different than my wife, who was told she is too outspoken. No different than any of the women in your lives, in this room, I stand before you as a man who believes we can and must be better. I stand before you with the understanding that women don't need saving. They have been and continue to be their own heroes. At one point or another, every woman in the world has been their own knight in shining armor. Rather than a savior, women need men such as you and such as me to no longer be obstacles. Obstacles which manifest in the way of sexism, misogyny, transphobia, toxic masculinity, violence, and unrightfully limiting bodily autonomy. These obstacles not only hold women back, they are the anchor that keeps our entire society from sailing towards progress. A cage that limits the potential of all humanity. But when considering these obstacles, I'm fueled by one simple truth. The patriarchy in all its forms has moments in which it begins. And if we have the collective courage to do and create moments in which it ends, we can make a change. Those moments 
they can start and should start right now. We must have the courage to hold ourselves accountable, to do what is right, not what is popular, to rewrite narratives such as boys will be boys, to stand up when men think catcalling is their right, to use the privilege to speak up in instances of wage gaps, glass ceilings, mansplaining, rape culture, guilting mothers, false gender roles, body shaming, and any other obstacles that our heroes face. It's not enough to help lift the weight of oppression from the shoulders of women. We must stand alongside them and take a sledgehammer to every single form of oppression. Because as long as the weight of oppression exists, we may all be crushed by it, even when men cannot see so. Men from all walks of life and every sector of endeavor must breathe new words and new spirit into words such as allyship. It's okay if you're not holding a sledgehammer before this. Pick it up now. Pick the sledgehammer up tomorrow. Pick the sledgehammer up the day after that. It's not about where you start, it's that you begin. Take that sledgehammer to every single obstacle that has been set in front of women. Because the worst thing we can do during a crisis, a crisis of morality is do nothing. I know none of us can accept that. The time is now for the gravity of women's rights to pull all men into action. I know we'll all do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joseph, for that important message that we can all take to heart as we go out into the world. Distinguished guests, it has been an honor and a pleasure to be your MC at this momentous gathering. From our esteemed speakers and panelists, we recognize that threats and obstacles to gender equality remain embedded in societies across the globe. But we also recognize the power and the potential of women to organize and lead the change, working with men like our He For She champions who are actively striving to achieve measurable, accountable benchmarks and inspiring and engaging other men to join the movement at all levels. Now, to close out our program, it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage a wonderful He For She supporter and activist in her own right, who we are so thankful for taking the time to be here with us today and perform for us. Please welcome singer, actress, activist, and star of Netflix's hit film, Purple Hearts, Sophia Carson. so honored to be here with all of you. Thank you so much, you and women, for celebrating and amplifying the voices of the greatest force in the world, women. In a room brimming with leaders and change makers, today we come together as one, men and women, he for she, to change the world together. And as we women stand before you with our heads held high, fighting for our rights with fearless and hopeful hearts i dedicate this song to you may we make a promise to ourselves to raise our voices louder than ever this song is for you Confrontation of her husband must strike Always felt like I should take all the blame But something is changing and I can't contain it no more 
yeah. All the speeches that I made in my head All the knows I know that I should have said Like waves in this water We're rising up stronger Come on If I was a man Then you would understand You wouldn't say I'm causing all this trauma Are you getting uncomfortable now? I'm a little too loud for you now Don't try to calm me down I was made to be loud Goodbye to living a lie Cause that got me nowhere in life Don't try to calm me down I was made to be loud I don't care if you don't like what you see I'm not pleasing you cause I'm pleasing me Not wasting more time I must speak up my mind when I want If I was a man Then you would understand You wouldn't say Are you getting uncomfortable now? I'm a little too loud for you now Don't try to calm me down I was made to be loud Goodbye to living a lie Cause that got me nowhere in life Don't try to calm Are you getting uncomfortable now? Am I a little too loud for you now? Well, don't try to calm me down. I was made to. Thank you so much. Thank you. How are we feeling? We feeling good? So this summer I released a movie on Netflix called Purple Hearts. A movie that I held very dear to my heart because I not only had the honor of starring in the film but I executive produced and I wrote the soundtrack for it and never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that this movie would go on to make history as one of the most watched films in the history of Netflix. And I've been brimming with gratitude ever since, so I would love to sing one of the songs that I wrote for the film for all of you today. From my heart to yours, this has come back home. Drowning in our eyes Don't know what we'll find Not sure should we fly or fight this We're terrified Pretending not that we don't care Tension cuts, cuts the air We're more than scared Lost inside our eyes 
we're terrified I don't know what's happening to me Can you hear my pulse beat underneath? Words are getting hard for me to speak That's new for me Letting my fear show till I can face them Letting my tears go till I can taste them How do I know where you and I go? Damn it, I hope you come back home Come back home It's hard to sleep at night when it's do or die the world spins round and round and we're paralyzed Pretending not that we don't care Tension cuts, cuts the air We're more than scared, lost inside our eyes We're terrified Letting my fear show till I can face them Letting my tears go till I can taste them How do I know where you and I go? Damn it, I hope you come back home Come back home Come back home I don't know what's happening to me Can you hear my pulse beat under me?